Evening, everybody. Am I on? Yes, I am. It's great to be here, and uh, we love the partnership with various churches across the Salt and Light Network, and we have a number of our, what we call our Eden teams. Uh, the Message Trust will never plant a church. Um, we always do it in partnership with uh, existing churches, and it's been a delight to, to plant our Eden teams into some of our nation's most deprived communities. And actually, Martin, it wasn't just one of the first, it was the very first Eden team. It was kind of a pragmatic response to God saving about 100 scallies in Britain's most deprived estate. And we had this idea together to move a bunch of young adults. We didn't know what we were doing, but God, you see, the eyes of the Lord are ranging the earth, not looking for talent or sexiness. He's just looking for a heart, isn't he? And I say, when myself and Martin and a couple of other church leaders said, look at Bench Hill in Withenshaw, you know, look at the lost kids and the brokenness and out of 34,000 wards, the, the hardest place in terms of uh, pretty much any, anything on the statistics, anything on the, you know, neighborhood statistics, Ben Shill was it. So we moved these brave young men and women in and Ben Shill, bit by bit, has been changed. And since then, we've done another 39 Eden teams. And everywhere we plant an Eden team, you know, it's not always instant. It's not revival in a fortnight. But actually, once we look back, in five or ten years, we see the community is changed because this gospel's lost none of its power. You know that, don't you? Last time I was with Steve was in the Lake District and a bunch of leaders had been gathered to look at some research that the Evangelical Alliance had done. And, uh, and it was, you know, um, some of it was encouraging, some of it was not so encouraging. But um, there was um, um, a black Pentecostal leader called Pastor Agu from the Redeemed Christian Church of God. And they are by far the fastest growing church in the country. They've planted 600 churches in a very short space of time. And uh, Pastor Agu said this, um, and I'm sure Steve will never forget it either. Pastor Agu said, well, it's really fascinating all this research because I thought all you had to do to plant a church was pray and fast and preach the gospel. <laughs> and we were like, hmm. <laughs> Because that's literally what they do. And of course, I'm not saying we shouldn't be relevant and real and do everything we can to meet people's real needs. But what about if we prayed more? What about if we fasted more? What about if we stuck the lamp on a stand and preached the gospel boldly? You know what happened? Whole communities will be transformed. Because this gospel ain't broke. And uh, we do all this stuff with the message trust. We do, you know, as I say, 39 Eden teams. We have workers in all the Northwest young offender institutions. And if you want to see the nearest thing we're seeing to revival, visit some of the prisons in the Northwest. It's like shelling peas getting young offenders to come to Christ. Honestly. And they mean it. And they, and they repent and they pray with their mates in, in, in the cells and there's healings going on. And, and yet, and we, in a short space of time, three years ago, we saw 400 decisions for Christ. In a little over a month, we saw 65 baptisms. Just amazing stuff. But then when they came out of prison, we would so often see them fall back into their old lifestyle. You know, their old mates are waiting for them, they're drug dealers, they're, they're either homeless or in a totally inappropriate hostel or a crime-ridden home and, and uh, they had no chance of getting a job because they had no training. I mean, who, you know, who wants to give uh, uh, someone a job if you've got a drug dealer or a knife criminal on your CV? So we realized that, um, you know, we needed to start to grasp that nettle. The other thing we do is we call it Christ-centered enterprise. We set up a bunch of businesses in Manchester. And so every time a, a young offender who's come to Christ leaves prison, the day they leave prison, we can give them a job, we can give them a safe home, and we can give them support in the community. And in three years, less than 10% of the, the young offenders we're working with have uh, re-offended. Now, government is pour, pouring billions into probation, and around 80% of the young people they work with end up re-offending. You know why that is? Because the gospel works. It's lost none of its power. It's strong enough to change society. And so we do Christ-centered enterprise, and we're starting to roll that out now around the nation. And the third thing we do is creative mission. We have five bands and a theater company. It's lovely that um, I've just been out for something to eat with Zark and Miriam Porter. Well, Zark was uh, the genius behind the Worldwide Message Drive. I had absolutely nil talent. And I used to rap like a demonized member of Sesame Street. And go, jumping in the house of God. And uh, it was terrible. But this guy made me look brilliant. 
He was the producer behind all the Worldwide Message Tribe. He was the musical guy behind all that. And he now lives half a mile from this site. So it's lovely to reconnect. But we started with Creative Mission. And I know that even though it was a bit of a funny sound and we had a, a few dancers from our youth group, including Zark's wife, Miriam, and, uh, and yet uh, the eyes of the Lord ranged the earth and, and looked at the Worldwide Message Tribe. I like that. I like the bold, unashamed gospel proclamation. The, 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 I, lo, I like the faith to revival, not just a band, but to see, you know, a move of God in this generation, especially in probably the, the, the city in the nation where, which was hemorrhaging young people faster than any other. And, I, you know, God liked that and he saw that. And so, but now we have a bunch of bands, five bands and a theatre company who actually know what they're doing. And they're amazing. And they're winning far more people than we ever won with the Worldwide Message Tribe back then, week in, week out. And uh, so about just over a year ago, we had this guy come over to, so now the message has grown. Uh, you know, I, um, we've been going 23 years of charity, and before that we were doing ministry out of the business I had in inner city Manchester. So maybe 28 years and we've grown, and we have over 100 staff in Manchester and programs all over the UK, and even in South Africa now, we have 25 staff and amazing things happening there. But um, I... I as the work's grown, we've, we, we've uh, tried to keep prayer front and center. So we gather once a, once a month, all our team, and so there may be 200 people in the room uh, who were involved at the message on the team. A guy called John Bunjo came over from Uganda, and he phoned me, and he said, I'm coming into the UK, I've been fasting and praying, and the Lord's given me a word for you, Andy. And uh, he came and gathered all our team in real expectancy, and he brought this word about everything going to the next level. A season of open doors. And, and since that time, I've had that prophetic word over the message five times in all sorts of different ways. And he said, and you, Andy, you need to go away and seek the Lord. And I'm, uh, you know, and John Bunjo means, you know, three weeks in the desert fasting. Uh, and I, I, I'm looking at my diary thinking, oh, no. I managed to get two days in the Lake District. And, and I ate. But... This is how kind the Lord is because he spoke to me so strongly, particularly from Isaiah chapter 60, about his time. You know, time means everything in the kingdom. At the end of Isaiah 60, it says, in its time, I'll do it swiftly, says the Lord. And three times over those two days, in extraordinary ways, God brought that passage again and again and again. I listened to two CDs in the car, didn't have any idea what they were about. Somebody just given it a Totally different speakers, different events, both on Isaiah 60. I went into my hotel room after walking, the beautiful hills, the Lake District, seeking the Lord. I put my Bible on my bed. I was going to read something from Romans and it fell open on Isaiah 60. I had this incredible time with the Lord. And the Lord said, arise, shine for your lights come. He said, the least are going to become a thousand, the smallest, the mighty nation. He said, gather my people, assemble my people, says the Lord. He says, the gates are open and they're going to stay open day and night. I'm telling you, the Lord was like downloading from heaven, I felt, in that hotel room in the Lake District. A word for this next season. And I came back so fired up and particularly fired up about preaching the gospel afresh. Boldly, unashamedly, raising up evangelists in every corner of this nation. Who, in the, who will not, not, be, not go in fear against this silly political correctness and militant atheism. But will say, Jesus is Lord. And he's lost none of his power. He can still change lives and this gospel still works. So we came up with this dream to start in Manchester. Something called the Higher Tour. And just at the time as we're, we're doing this, I'm reading all this stuff about culture changing movements. Do you know that you don't need 51% of people in a nation to see a whole culture change? All the evidence is, if you can get over 10% truly on side, for good or evil, you can change a whole culture. And I started thinking, what would it, build, what would it look like to see over 10% of the young people in this nation as a starting point to believe, could I see that? Could we, well, I can't clearly, but could we as the church of Jesus see over 10% of our young people truly on fire, committed to loving the friends, committed to proclaiming the gospel? You know how many more disciples we'd need, I believe, in this nation to see that? In schools, about 200,000. I can believe for that, you know. And I certainly want to plan for it. I certainly want to step out in faith towards it. And you never know, maybe God will bless us. You never know, maybe the eyes of the Lord will range the earth. 
looking for a heart and he'll strongly support that man or woman who buys into this course. So we're doing a, a thing starting in Manchester, we're calling it the Higher Tour, and we've got, we're, having, we're in consultation with leaders all over this nation, all the big urban conurbations, where the people live, where the young people are, where so much of the pain and, 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 um, and brokenness in our, la in our cities and uh, amongst our young people are, and we're planning. And so before I get into my talk, don't worry Martin, I'm gonna behave myself with the timing, right? I'm watching this clock. <laughs> But I want to just show you this video and then we're going to get into the Bible together. So, so just watch this because I want you to pray for this. I'd love you to go into the resources area and sign up to our mailing list. I'd love you if you're a leader in one of the big cities of this nation to start praying that at a higher tour. We've got youth evangelists at The Message who win souls. And they, we're helping them preach the gospel to produce disciples. And we're coming up with all sorts of resources. There's never been a major youth mission in this nation, you know, in screen culture. We've got an opportunity for the gospel to disciple young people. Yes, of course we want to root them in local churches, but to help them become the best they can be through the mobile phones and through their iPads that no other generation's ever had. Is that right? Let's try it. Let's have a go. Do something to reach a, a huge number of young people together. Two million young people and believe for 200,000 disciples. It's called a higher tour and I hope it's coming to a city near you. So all right, watch the screen. There's so much history in this place. For us, this is where it all began. We wrote to every church in Manchester in 1988 and invited them to get on board with the biggest youth mission this city's ever seen. And they did. Night after night, we filled this venue. And night after night, young people found Christ. We're going to see God do some big, big new things through this event. You are up for that, aren't you? We came here because it was big. We came here to put the lamp on a stand to shout as loud as we could that Jesus is still alive and he still wants to change lives. We believe God's saying it's time to go big again. Over the next five years, we're planning for hundreds of intensive regional schools missions, followed by arena-sized gigs with a vision to reach two million young people with the gospel and in partnership dream of seeing 200,000 on fire disciples. That's the kind of number that shifts culture. We're calling it the Higher Tour, and it's starting right here in Manchester in 2016. Higher represents an incredible opportunity for the local church to work together to see the kind of numbers of young people engaged that none of us could reach on our own. I truly believe that Higher could be a turning point for this nation. So as a church, we're getting fully behind the Higher Tour because it's not just a relevant way for our young people to hear about the gospel, but it's also a fantastic opportunity for them to be supported as they make long-term decisions to follow God. Higher starts in Manchester in March 2016 before going region by region across the UK over the next five years. We need you to sign up now to pray, to give and to partner with us to make it happen. We believe it's going to be the start of something big. Come on, it's time to go higher. It's not going to stop us having a right good go for Jesus. And uh, I hope you like the sound of it and you'll want to sign up uh, in the resources area and find out more. Um, I hope you'll pray like mad for your region. That, uh, and we'll partner with lots of other youth ministries and evangelists to see this thing happen. Okay, let's get in the Bible together. I want to talk tonight from a very familiar passage. Um, Isaiah chapter 61. Lots of you will know these beautiful words. Um, let me read just the first three verses. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to pray, proclaim good news to the poor. Send me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty, instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. 
Beautiful verses. A guy 640 years before Christ saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. A big deal in Isaiah's day to say the spirit has anointed me. Because I'm sure you know in the Old Testament before Christ, the spirit of God came on a man and anointed him for purpose. And Isaiah was anointed to prophesy. What a responsibility. Isaiah had this special ministry of prophesying about the Messiah, as did several of the prophets. I mean, what a responsibility. Hundreds of years before the Messiah, you've got this responsibility of putting this spotlight on the guy. A man will come and you will tell us exactly where he's going to live, exactly what family he's going to be born, exactly what he's going to do, exactly how he's going to die. All about his life, death, ministry, resurrection. You're going to prophesy it all. You're going to prophesy what his friends will do to him. All hundreds of things that nobody could ever fix. So that people know in generations to come that he's the one. And there is one who fulfilled all the prophecies. 300 and odd very specific prophecies from the Old Testament. No other man's fulfilled more than two or three. Jesus, because there probably were people, weren't there, who were born in Bethlehem, who were nailed through the hands and feet on a cross. But Jesus fulfilled all 340 I mean, you've got to be blind not to see he wasn't the Savior, the Messiah. That's enough for me, don't you think? And Isaiah had this anointing from God, anointing to prophesy and preach. But throughout the Old Testament, there are men who were anointed for specific purpose. Well, they, they had a gift, but the gift was accelerated and magnified and, and strengthened through the anointing. Samson was a strong man. But you read in Judges, under the anointing of God, he was able to bring down buildings. But Be Bezal, Bezazel, Bezal, Bezazazazal. <laughs> Sound like Tommy Cooper. <laughs> Bezal, in Exodus 31, had an amazing gift of craftsmanship and artistic design. But the anointing of God came on him. And he, he, it was another level, another level of creativity. Another level of anointing of David, the king and the great worship leader in the Old Testament. The Bible says the spirit came on him mightily. But it also says in the very next verse in 1 Samuel chapter 16, that the spirit departed from Saul. The anointing could leave you. That's why David's cry in Psalm 51 at his time of failure and sin was, Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He knew he could lose the anointing. And what a mess he would make of leading worship. What a disaster he'd be. What a mess he'd make of leading the nation if the anointing left him. He was desperate. Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. But praise God, we're not in the Old Testament. Anybody glad we live this side of Jesus? You see, because in Luke chapter 4, if we do fast forward those 640 years through history, we find Jesus, it's time. Time means everything in the kingdom of God. Like I was saying from Isaiah 60. And do you ever think to yourself, you know, how frustrated it must have been for the angels. All this palaver around the birth of Jesus. They've been waiting these hundreds of years. And they know the Messiah. They know Jesus is on the scene. They've had their angelic choirs on the hillside. They've had all the prophecies. The Spirit's been poured out left, right and center. And then 30 more years of waiting before it's time. I mean, he's there. And all that happened is he, he grew up in favor with God and man and made a few tables. <laughs> you know, the angels are like, come on, Father, God. Anyway, it's time. Jesus knows it's time. So he goes into the desert and he fasts and prays. And in Luke chapter 4, it said he went into the desert filled with the Spirit. A few verses later, after these 40 days of fasting and praying and spending time with his Father... The Bible says he came out of the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference, you know. The filling, I believe, very often comes at times like this. We meet with God's people around his word. We're desperate for him and he fills us with his spirit. He anoints us with his spirit. But the power comes when we carry it out there. The power comes in the communities. The power comes as we take, as we get filled here and live it out on the streets. And Jesus 
went straight into the synagogue. And as happens to people who are moving in the power of the Spirit, coincidentally, it was his turn to preach. God gave him a platform and it was his turn to read the Scriptures. And coincidentally, the set reading for the day was Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus stood up. Normally, he would sit down to read the Scriptures. So there was something unusual going on. And the Bible says, every eye was fastened on him in Luke chapter 4. Everybody put the mobile phones down. Everybody who was pretending to take notes but really looking at the Facebook, turn the phones off. I mean, they really did that ultimate sacrifice. Put the phones on airplane mode. This was the moment. Every eye was fastened on him. All the little kids were looking at him. There was something about this man, the anointing, the power of the Holy Ghost was all over him. I mean, how much would you give to have been there on that day? If you'd wanted to see the Rolling Stones' best price tickets at the O2, it would have cost you 700 quid. To watch those geriatric blokes jig around and play those songs we all love in the far distant past. No, 700 quid. I mean, how much would you have gone to have been there in that synagogue on that day as Jesus read Isaiah 61? There was something about the way he read it that just gripped every person in that place. I mean, was it the spirit of the sovereign Lord? He's on me! He's anointed me! Or did he just read it straight? We don't know, do we? But we know that there was something about it. And then it was time to bring the sermon. The sermon was eight words long. And yet it was the most profound sermon the world's ever heard. In your hearing, these scriptures are fulfilled. Get ready to see a man who lives under the true anointing of God. Get ready to see a man. Preach good news to the poor. Bind up the brokenhearted. Open the eyes of the blind. Announce the year of the Lord's favor. Here goes, guys. And for three and a half years, Jesus did it, didn't he? Perfect model of the anointed life. And he gathered a bunch of ragbag, unschooled, ordinary guys around him to model it. And he even let them play. And these funny boys could do what he did under the anointing. But the anointing, even at that point, still seemed like it was coming and going. And then, then they, put, they put these guys, the 12 disciples and, and the wider group that were following Jesus around were excited that he really was the prom, the one of promise. And I bet you they were going through the verses in the Old Testament. Yes, yes, yes. This is the one, everyone, this Jesus we're with is fulfilling all the promises, all the spotlights on him. There's an increasing excitement. The only thing they couldn't cope with was when he was arrested. And he was tried for blasphemy. Because they knew in the Old Testament that he said, cursed is anyone who's nailed to a tree. They knew there was a curse about that. Surely that could never be the Messiah. What they didn't realize, of course, was that was exactly what Jesus came for. It was time. The timing, the perfect time for him to die on the cross and take the punishment for all the sin of mankind. To be rejected by the Father so you don't have to be rejected. He died on the cross. But then he rose from the death. Rose from the dead and conquered sin and death once and for all. And for six weeks he proved to his friends it really was him. He preached to a, a crowd around this size. He, he made breakfast for them on the beach. He ministered to them for six weeks. And then he gathered them on a hillside. And he said, boys, it's time for me to go. And you won't be surprised if you don't know the story to know that the disciples said, no way, Jesus. You're not going. It was, I mean, this is the message version, by the way, right? It, it was bad enough first time. You can't leave us now. And Jesus said, it's better if I go. It's better if I leave because if I leave, I can leave behind my, my spirit. And the Bible says Jesus breathed on, I'm on that hillside. The breath of life, the very breath of God, the creation, creative force of the universe, because Jesus was God become man. He breathed on him and said, receive my spirit. And then he said this, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Go on. 
as the Father sent me. To preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to open the eyes of the blind, to announce the year of the Lord's favour. Go on, this is how you do it. And it wasn't a temporary anointing that was going to come and go. It was the spirit full to overflowing. They're meant to be walking in it 24-7. And we're here today because those unskilled, ordinary lads went on and did it. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we need some people who get serious about this stuff, don't we? You know, I I love what's happening in the church. I love that increasingly we have become good news to the poor. You know, you've got to be quite a, a stiff church leader, haven't you? Not to be engaged in community. Not to be serving and blessing the poor, following Christ as we, as we set up food banks and I'm all over it. And debt relief, to feed the homeless, it's a gospel imperative, of course it is, we've got to do that stuff. I love the fact that we're waking up more and more, I believe, to the poorest of the poor. A little while ago, well 2000 actually, year 2000, message was starting to grow really fast and we had all these programs and we ju- were organizing this monster mission called Message 2000 in, in, in Manchester and uh, loads going on and, this, and I had a phone call from someone at Altrincham Baptist Church said there's this amazing prophet lady who's come, come in from the US and she just has to be given some names, people, people she doesn't want to know anything about and just get the word of the Lord for you. And she'd like to meet you and Michelle. So I'm like really busy. I said to you, Michelle, do you want to meet this woman from Dallas? And fortu- I didn't. She did, fortunately. So we went, we went to see this lady called Pat Pierce. She looks like a tele-evangelist wife. She's got like boof on hair and loads of makeup and a loud sort of de- Texas stroll. Oh, it's awesome to see you and your wife's so beautiful. I'm like, get me out of here. And she, t- she turned to Michelle, this lady. In 2000, she said, oh, God's seen your heart for hurting women. And he's going to just open doors so you can bless hurting women. And prophesied all this stuff over Michelle that was totally bob on what was going on in Michelle's ministry and heart at that time. And Michelle starts crying her eyes out. And I knew it was the Lord. And the presence of the Lord is like heavy and I'm I'm feeling convicted. And uh, she turned to me and she said, the Lord's seen your heart for urban youth. Didn't know anything about me. Seen your heart for urban youth. For the Lord says today, he's pleased with that heart. He's going to bless that. He's going to favor you. You're going to see many urban youth one for Christ. But today the Lord says, do not forget the poorest of the poor. And I knew it was the Lord. I knew it was a word from God that we should never forget the poorest of the poor. And with all our church planting around the UK, all our ministry, all our vision, all our desire to bless our local communities, never forget the poorest of the poor. So often the breakthrough comes in, in our, the broken men and women we're working with is when we, we, we remember the poorest of the poor. We send them out to minister to the poorest of the poor. We, we, we do everything we can to give sacrificially towards ministries amongst the poorest of the poor. Of course, it's gospel stuff. We've got to be good news to the poor. But the Bible didn't say Jesus' gospel manifesto wasn't be good news to the poor, you know. Jesus' gospel manifesto was proclaim good news to the poor or preach good news to the poor and increasingly you know I'm a bit scared that there's been a swing in our generation swing towards caring for the poor blessing the poor loving the poor doing all kinds of ministries that benefit the poor of course we've got to do that stuff but please don't take our gospel away from us Please don't stop us preaching the gospel and if we can't preach the gospel we're never going to see the poor truly set free Do you believe that? I mean, do we still believe that? I was at New Wine the last few days. And the testimony on the first night, and this this is like what's going on in my heart at the moment. We've got to see the gospel. Alongside all the kindness, all the Eden workers sacrificing so much, the prisons ministry, all the kindness. We've got to see the lamp on a stand. We've got to see the gospel preached in every corner of this nation. We've got to see young evangelists released. I'm not going to preach at any of the higher gigs, I've decided. I'm just going to do everything I can to train up young evangelists and equip them to train other young evangelists. And we're setting up groups all around the nation to see that happen. But anyway, my first night in New Wine, the first testimony on the first night was a lady called Audrey. You know, 
I mean, and one of these wonderful Jesus testimonies, you know, very broken lady and heroin addict and all kinds of pain and all kinds of rejection. And she said this, I wrote it down, I'd done all the programs. I'd gone through counseling again and again. I'd gone through rehab again and again. And I tried my best, but I just wasn't getting any better. Then someone shared Jesus with me and everything changed. That's it, isn't it? You know, there's some things that only Jesus can do. I'm going to tell you about three of them right now. Three of my friends from Manchester. And we've got some pictures up here. This lady. We've got a picture on the screen, Laura, she's called. Laura, three years ago, was eating out of bins in Glasgow. And some of my mates from Victory Outreach went up to Glasgow and did a mission. And uh, they preached the gospel and they managed to get, literally get homeless people. She'd been on the streets for three years, 20-year heroin, addi- heroin addiction, and they're totally broken, multiple suicide attempts, in and out of prison, you know, the absolutely bottom of the barrel, most broken. And Laura stumbled into this meeting, Victory Outreach meeting, and heard some testimonies from former addicts who'd given their life to Christ, went to the front, gave her life to Jesus. And because Victory Outreach are bonkers, but amazing, they said, where are you going to stay tonight? She said, I've got nowhere to stay. I'm homeless. She had a T-shirt and a shorts and a mobile phone. That was it. So they said, come and live with us. And they put her in the minibus and took her back to Manchester put them in one of their rehab houses for two years. And I got to meet, you know, I go and preach at Victory Outreach. And, and I got to spend time with Laura. And, and, and Paul Lloyd, the minister, said, you know, I've heard she's a Vidal Sassoon trained hairdresser. I'm like, we need a hairdresser. We need somebody to come into our salon. We've got all these girls from Style Prism. We're training in, you know, nail technicians and massaging and hair. And so Laura, so we gave Laura a job. She's like this booked out, amazing hairdresser in our shine hair salon. And she's this incredible role model to the other girls and an amazing evangelist. She just went into style prison and gave a testimony and 26 of the girls gave their life to Christ. And she's totally free, totally free from drugs. I mean, is there some things that only Jesus can do? Only the power of the gospel, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit breaking in and changing everything. Do you wanna see Laura's husband? This is Cyril. Cyril works for the message. He he, he, he does all our maintenance. He's a grafter. He's a brilliant joiner and all kinds of stuff. Cyril was, again, repeat offending. He horribly abused as a child. He's, He's told publicly about this terrible abuse as a child. And so often, without rejection, you become a self harmer. You become an alcoholic and then a drug addict and then you're in and out of prison. He did a four and a half year stretch and then another stretch. Then you did a 12 month stretch for a crime he didn't even commit because he wouldn't grass on his mate. And he came out of that final stretch and he was, he was, well, they said he had a split personality and he was cutting himself and then he started eating razor blades and so they sectioned him, told him you've got a split personality and you'll never change and you'll be spending the rest of your life in a, in, in a psychiatric hospital. Guess what? Somebody preached the gospel to Cyril and everything changed and he became a new creation in Christ and he was healed and delivered of this split personality and he's this amazing man of God and I got a message from him today on his holidays he's in Parkhead working with our Eden team in Parkhead I mean this crazy estate in Glasgow where the average life expectancy is 56. Can you believe that? In the UK And he's been doing a mission with Laura. And he texts me with excitement about leading a heroin addict to Christ on the streets of Glasgow today. Don't you love it? Some things only Jesus can do. Do you want one more? Do you want one more? This guy's called Jason. He's the first person we employed in our building team when we had this. I mean, setting up these businesses sounds like fun. It's the hardest thing we've ever done. Try running profitable businesses with people who've never worked before in their lives and no training, no experience. People whose lives, even as disciples, are roller coasters. But anyway, Jason is is the shining star of the Enterprise Center. Out of 13 years, 12 of them have been done in prison. He's not just a drug dealer. He's at the center of all kinds of wickedness in Manchester, was. He's the prison drug dealer. But he just gave up on life and just was so broken, so lost. He stopped eating for 11 days. They 
They moved him into the prison hospital wing, force feeding him. And then somebody told him about Jesus and everything changed. He gave his life to Christ. And uh, he, so for two years then, we were able to disciple Jason in prison. And we were waiting for him, the first job. And in some ways, he's the inspiration for the Enterprise Centre. Because for three years, he'd worked for two weeks in his life before joining the Enterprise Centre. I think he's been off for one day in the last three years. Uh, he's an amazing evangelist, an amazing musician. We found out this guy's got the voice of an angel, writes these incredible songs to Jesus. And he, he set up a, a program in Withenshaw, working with all the scallies with polytunnels, growing organic vegetables. Can you believe it? You couldn't make it up, could you? <laughs> and so we're helping him to set up a business, an organic vegetable growing business. Just them. There's some things only Jesus can do. You see, the gospel's lost none of its power. It was when they heard the good news that everything changed. We just bought, two weeks ago, bought this building. Uh, we're calling it, it's a 13-bedroom former URC manse that then became a, an old people's home in Withenshaw. And we saw the building, it's like perfect because we're putting these ex-offenders in houses but they struggle sometimes when they're in threes and fours in a house. We needed something bigger, something more community life. And we had a family, one of our very best, who were crazy enough to want to move into this house and care, live with a bunch of ex-offenders and ex-addicts who've met Jesus. And, and so we saw the house, it was perfect, 13 bedrooms. And then we put a deposit on it. February the 14th, Valentine's Day last year, 2014. And then the council said, no way you're getting planning permission on that in Withenshaw. The local councillors all kicked off. The residents kicked off. The police kicked off. I went to a meeting virtually on my hands and knees with the, with the leaders in the Manchester Council. said, look, can't you see what we're trying to do? We're not going to put feral youths in this. These are people who have encountered Christ and are ready to turn their lives around. We're going to give them job and support through the local church. And the woman, the senior official at Manchester Council said, can I just say, Andy, we're not going to approve it. Get your deposit back. And I went out oh, oh. Just because we knew this was the Lord, this building. And we claimed it, we'd prayed over it, we'd walked around it, we'd done the whole thing. And uh, so, so I thought, no, I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to the voice of the Spirit. I went to the planning meeting in Withenshaw, full of faith and confidence, prayed, fasted. There's a group of us confident that they said no, but the Lord was going to say yes. And they turned us down. So we appealed. We're like relentless, we are having this building. The next planning meeting, we prayed even harder and we went into the meeting and they approved it. And everything's turned round. And suddenly the council want us to be there. They're like, I didn't really say that, did I? And I went to this meeting with all the senior officials about something else, you know, about, about trying to get support for another project we're doing. But one of them said, well, I can't believe what's happening with that building, Andy. You're a lucky guy, aren't you? <laughs> Everybody seems to be suddenly for you. It's the favour of God. It's the eyes of the Lord ranging the earth, just looking for a heart. Of course God wants Christians to sacrifice and move in alongside the marginalised and the broken. Of course he wants us to preach the gospel boldly. Time to see people who are passionate for the poor, good news people for the poor. People have all sorts of adventures on behalf of the poor and the marginalized. It's a gospel imperative. We can't call ourselves followers of Jesus unless we do that. But please not, not, not call ourselves followers of Jesus unless we proclaim good news to the poor. Unless we duck and dive and dream, how are we going to see that every person in this nation hears the good news, relevantly proclaimed, and has the opportunity to respond? It's the stuff that changes nations. It always has and it always will. It's our gospel. And if we keep quiet, how are they going to hear it? I was gripped just to finish again, afresh by this verse. You know this verse, Romans 10. Verse 14, how can they call on one if they've not believed him? And how can they believe in one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And I feel like the next years of my life, until I go and be with Jesus, the key thing is raising up young, radical, bold, unashamed 
preachers who in season, out of season, from stages and one-on-one on on the streets will share the good news, believe that it's lost none of its power. And as the pressure comes against us, as the tide of public, public opinion, as the dark gets darker, you watch the light get lighter. You watch because the light of Jesus, the light of this gospel can push back any darkness, no matter how deep and dark. Are you up for it? So I want to do two things as we come into land at the end of this evening. I'm an evangelist. Um, And I'd I'd be stupid to be in a gathering this size and not give people the opportunity to accept Christ. I mean, I, I don't know whether there's people in this room who don't know Jesus, but just in case, we better give you the opportunity, haven't we? There are meetings I've been in where Jesus couldn't get anyone saved. Because everyone's saved. But actually, I've been in gatherings like this again and again, where there's people whose hearts are beating. Even last night, you know, we saw a couple of people saved at New Wine in a, in a celebration about this size. And, and hundreds of people who said they wanted to lay down their lives and follow Christ. It was a beautiful thing that happened. My mate said, See that guy sat there in the sweatshirt, Sam Ward, who heads up the Eden Network. He said, I really think he's going to give his life to Jesus. He said, I said, what do you mean? He said, I just do. I just think that guy. And he sat there and didn't get involved in the worship, looked a bit bored. And and then I preached. And then I did it. I said, you know, if you want to give your life to Christ for the first time, just come out in front of a a thousand people or 1,500 people, whatever it was at New Wine. Come out and stand at the front boldly. Start publicly. So I'll go on publicly. We had one girl come out, right? And I went, I'm sure there's more. (laughs) I think there may be more. (laughs) And then I was just about to go, you know, we're just waiting. And I was just waiting. And the guy gets up and comes down the front and stands at the front. The guy in the blue sweatshirt that Sam wore. And Sam was like running across the stage to hug this guy. Next 45 minutes, Sam and this guy were praying. So it was just beautiful. So why don't we stand together? And I want to do that. And then I want to pray for those of you. I've got no magic powers. But the Lord loves to give out the gift to the evangelist. And I think there's some of you church leaders tonight. The last thing I want to say before we just pray and ask the Lord to do something. There's some of you churches, church leaders, who need to wake up to doing appeals in your churches in season and out of season. I tell you what, I honestly believe your churches would grow a whole lot faster if you call people out every service. I've seen it all over the nation. Because what happens is the people in the church suddenly start bringing their friends along. They're suddenly praying for the lost in a fresh way. And some weeks you'll see none. Other weeks you'll see lots. I've seen it again and again. And just about every, pretty much every fast growing church in the UK that's growing with salvation growth is doing this. They've got faith. There's opportunity to respond to the gospel. And if they don't, it's like praying for people. They don't see everybody come to Christ the first week. They don't stop praying for people. You understand what I'm saying? So I just would really encourage you. Let's put the gospel on a stand. Let's believe that Jesus loves to save. And let's celebrate the greatest miracle of all, the miracle of salvation in our churches. So let's just pray now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're here. You're here by your spirit. And I believe you want to give your people a fresh anointing. Lord, thank you that your spirit can invade any broken life, any empty life, any lost life, and change everything. You're the God who loves to save. And I pray now, Lord, in this tent, salvation will spring up from the ground. I pray you'll do the greatest miracle of all. You'll forgive people's sins and you'll set them on fire. You'll anoint them and you'll send them out of this conference tomorrow. New people ready to serve you and win others for you. I pray in your name, Lord. So I just want to invite you. As I say, it would be wrong of me, I believe, tonight not to give this opportunity. So if you're not a Christian and you want to be a Christian, or maybe there's some of you here who you, you just don't know if you're Christian anymore. You're just so far away. You've lost it. This is not some little recommitment for Christians who want to go for it. If you're not a Christian and you want to give your life to Christ tonight, why in front of, I guess, well over a thousand people? What a great way to start. We're not going to do an every eye closed, every head bowed. Oh, I can see that hand. Put it down. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're going to say, just be brave. 
we come out in front of everybody and we're just going to wait for a moment. Just see, see if there's anybody who needs Christ. You're not coming to Andy Hawthorne, but you're going public, coming to Jesus Christ. So anybody here wants to give their life to Christ? Here's one. Come out, mate. Beautiful. Come on. Come on. Come on. Stand right there, mate. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Your heart's beating. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Christ. Prepare to go public. It's worth it for you, mate. It is, isn't it? Of course it is. It's worth this whole convention. Jesus would have gone all the way to the cross for this one guy. It's amazing. But is there more? Are there more? Come on, here we come. Come on. Come on. Come on. Beautiful. Beautiful. Come on. Yeah. I tell you what. I tell you what. If, if people were, if people were jumping out of wheelchairs now, we'd be getting more excited than that. If cancerous tumours were shrinking right now, this is a greater miracle going on before our eyes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, we want to see all that. I'm not playing that we want to be laying our hands on the sick and seeing the miraculous breakout because we're anointed to open the eyes of the blind. But actually, this is what we want. This is where it all starts. Anybody else? Just a couple more minutes. Anybody else want to just publicly, right last night at this conference, give your life to Christ? Thank you, Lord. Just don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else? I'm just going to wait 30 seconds. You don't mind me doing that, do you? <laughs> I'm just going to wait and just see if there's anybody else in this tent. If not, we'll just pray for these guys. But beautiful. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And the, you know this. So 10 seconds, I'm going to pray, right? I just want to pray for these guys. And then I want us to just pray a prayer all together. Love you guys at the front, just to pray this with your whole heart. Just a prayer of accepting Christ into your life. Making him Lord. Committing yourself to him for the rest of your life. Promising to follow him and he'll help you and he'll change you. Everything will be changed tonight. Whatever you've been, wherever you've been through, he'll change you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you so much for these uh, men and women. Thank you that you're the God who loves to save. God, I pray that just as they've gone public, tonight and stood in front of all these people, I pray their lives will publicly shine for you. I pray Holy Spirit invade their lives, anoint them, fill them, equip them to be men and women of God. Can we just, you five and all of us joining, because this is a family thing, can you just pray this out loud from your bottom of your heart? Pray it after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of every sin. And fill me with your spirit. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you're alive today. Be alive in me, Jesus. And with your help, Lord, I'll live all out for you for the rest of my days. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a round of applause. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Yeah. Beautiful. And I just want to say, yeah. So maybe, maybe you could, just guys, we just love a few people to pray with you. Is that right, Martin? And we've got some people who pray here. That'd be great. Just go with that side because we just want to do one more thing. And you know what? Wonderful. Thanks so much. So there's just, 
guys just praying there, beautiful. And you know what, let me say this right. I had a girl, after the two people came in the front and we prayed for Oliver, I had a girl come in. She only came in for the appeal bit, she didn't even hear my talk. <laughs> and then she went up to one of the ministry team and gave her life to Christ. Now, last night, so you don't become a Christian by coming to the front. And so, you know, you can still go over there and there's people waiting who will lead you to Christ. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and so, you know, please, even if you, if you couldn't bring yourself, that doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is surrendering all to Christ, making him Lord and asking him to take control of your life and accepting what he did on the cross for you and asking him to come in and fill you. When you do that, he always says yes. It works every time. It's never failed. Honestly, it's never failed. So if you can do that now. But what I want to just do before, I, before we bring the band back is I want to pray for those of you, as I've been talking about mission and preaching good news to the poor, your heart's been beating and there's been something inside. It's been resonating. And you're like, oh God, I long for a fresh measure of the gift of the evangelist. I want that to be a priority and a focus for me. Uh, so, some way I want it to define me that I'm just out there. I'm one of these guys who looks for every opportunity, whether it's a little opportunity or if God sees fit, a big opportunity. But I just want to be someone who preaches the gospel to as many people as possible. I want to be somebody who has faith to invite a response, whether it's in an office or on the street or from a stage. Do you understand? And God gives you that faith. It's the gift of the evangelist. It's a gift. But it's a gift God gives out a whole lot more when there's expectancy. You know, and when there's mission going on, God gives out that gift. And as we move into this fresh season, I believe, of mission, we need a whole lot more evangelists. Are you with me? And now, as, again, I haven't got any magic powers, but the Lord just loves to use ordinary dummies like me. He does. You know, people are evangelists just... Is there any way I can just pass on that gift or ask God to just anoint people afresh with that gift? I'd love to do that. So, you know, if that's you, would you just come down the front right now? Come down the front right now. And if you really long for that fresh measure, and some of you for the first time are just going to, you, you, you've been doing the work of the evangelist, but tonight is the night when God's going to give you the gift of the evangelist. And you're going to be able to share the gospel with clarity in a fresh way, a simple way, so that people who don't know Jesus understand it. You're going to have faith to believe that wherever you go, salvation is going to spring up. It's going to happen because you're a gifted evangelist. It's not you, it's the Lord. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. I've seen it all over the world. I've seen it amongst my team, just like salvation machines. Wherever they go, people get saved. Don't you want to be that kind of person? It's the Lord. It's not about being gifted as a superstar preacher. It's just the gift of the evangelist that reproduces salvation. We've got to see it all over our nation. Can we just come down the front a bit so everyone can get as near? There's loads, which is ace. And, and we're going to just pray for a proper Holy Spirit moment now. Because the Lord loves this. The Lord whose eyes are ranging the earth. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray tonight you will anoint these men and women with a fresh measure of the gift of the evangelist. I pray they'll know it. Maybe not necessarily because they feel anything tonight, but because as they leave here, you just break their hearts for the lost. Lord, we know everybody is either lost or found. We pray through these men and women, many will be found. Many will discover life in Christ. I pray, God, I've seen it all over the world. Do it here tonight, this fresh anointing with the gift of the evangelist. I pray people who have been doing this for years, faithfully serving you, will suddenly start to see their family, their neighbours, their communities, their churches, fresh wave of salvation, the miracle we long for more than any other God. Pour down your spirit and I pray you'll give these men and women crazy dreams to win people for Jesus. The kind of dreams that only you can fulfill. I pray those who have been disappointed as they've stepped out before will step out again in Jesus' name. Lord, pour down your spirit. Come on, Lord. Raise up men and women in this salt and light movement who will win a massive harvest for you. And we say, Lord, if there is a hundredfold harvest, humbly, God, we want it. We want it for you. So I pray, God, tonight you'll raise up men and women with a good and a noble heart. 
a heart to love the poor, to preach good news to the poor, and a heart to keep going to the very end. Even when others would give up and sack it off to keep going. Because the only thing we'll take with us is people. And Lord, we want to take many, many, many people with us. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Pour down your spirit on your people, Lord. For this great purpose of winning souls. Oh, God. How can they call on one they've not believed and how can they believe in one whom they've not heard and how can they pre here without someone preaching to them I pray these men and women will be that someone who go to those who've never heard it in language they can understand and give them the opportunity to respond in Jesus name yeah.